Welcome to another episode of The Artsy Raven, a show about writing and publishing with your host, J.F. Garrard. Welcome to another episode of The Artsy Raven. I'm your host, J.F. Garrard. And today's episode is called Chasing a Good Story as a Journalist. And we will be speaking to Emi Sasagawa, author of Between Word and Mouth, which will be published in the Belief Anthology. Emmy is a Brazilian Japanese award-winning journalist turned communicator who lives in Vancouver, BC. Her work has been published by a range of publications from the Washington Post to Room. She's currently working on a book length manuscript inspired by her experience coming out and moving to London, England at the age of 19. Emmy is a graduate of the Writer Studio at SFU and is presently completing an MFA in creative writing at UBC. So thank you, uh, Emmy, for visiting us at the Artsy Raven. Well, thank you for having me. Can you tell us a bit about your background and why you started writing? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, um, I was very much an introverted child and one that lived in my own head as I think a lot of writers are. Um, and some of my first uh, exposure to sort of storytelling and stories was the Aesop fables. My mom got me hooked on those when I was pretty young. Um, and I started writing uh, maybe when I was around six or seven years old. And I have this vivid memory of being seven and writing uh, a 10 story book on Microsoft 95. Uh, and then taking, um, having it printed and bound and then going door to door in our building selling it. So I think in some ways, um, storytelling has been part of my life from a very, very young age. Um, as I grew up, my interests ended up taking me in different directions, but I continued writing. So first um, I was writing in an academic setting. I did my bachelor of science in international relations with a focus on international political economy. So I was writing a lot of academic work then um, I became a journalist. And so a lot of the writing that I did um, was, you know, uh, news, uh, uh, some feature writing pieces. And then now um, I do a lot of writing as uh, creative writing. So mostly creative nonfiction. Um, I think there's something very satisfying about uh, putting words on paper. And I think uh, it's, it's definitely become a way for me to sort of process some of the things that happened in my life. So did you grow up in Canada? Like you spent your childhood mostly here or in other countries? Uh, no, I did not grow up in Canada. So uh, I was born in Rio uh, de Janeiro uh, in Brazil. And uh, when I was about three years old, my family moved to Sao Paulo, also in Brazil. And we lived there until I was about 10, uh, sorry, 13. And um, at that point, my dad was transferred. So my dad worked uh, for a multinational company and we were transferred to Panama City. We lived there for about two years, two years and a half. And that was the first time that I was really exposed to English. So I learned how to speak English at the age of 13. Um, and then uh, we moved to the Netherlands um, to a town uh, right outside of Amsterdam called Amstelveen. Um, and I did my last three years of high school there. And then I moved to the UK, to London to do my undergrad. Um, and then I moved back to Brazil uh, for two years to work as a journalist. And, and I came to Canada in 2013 to do my master's of journalism at UBC. So yeah, I've moved around quite a bit. And, and in fact, none of my family actually lives here. Um, they're all kind of spread out all over the world. I have to say, listening to you talk about all these different cities, I don't know why you picked the most boring country to settle in, uh, for now anyways. <laughs> but, you know. It's uh, actually, I, I feel, I have felt the most comfortable in Canada um, in all the places that I have lived. Um, especially I think it, it just sort of coincided with some of you know some personal growth as well but um, I've lived in places where being um, gay or uh, being in a same-sex uh, relationship was uh, difficult and um, at times even 
um, scary. And so to be here, especially in Vancouver, who happens to be a pretty open city compared to some of the other places that I've lived has been um, really amazing. I'm very, very grateful to be here. Well, I guess fundamentally feeling safe in your environment is something a lot of people take for granted in yeah. like Canada, I think, right? So how did, like, why did you choose journalism? Like what type of training did you have to do to become a journalist? Yeah, so uh, like I said, I did my undergrad in London um, in international relations with a focus on international political economy. And I studied at the London School of Economics. So a lot of my friends were actually going into investment banking or consulting. So working for you know one of the big four. And as I uh, considered uh, taking the same path, it just didn't sit right with me. It didn't feel like it was for me. Um, I really couldn't see myself in that type of profession. So um, I took some time and decided to move back to Brazil. I hadn't lived there in quite a few years. And I was really hoping to reconnect with my mother's uh, culture. Um, and within, uh, I would say, probably two to three months of being in Sao Paulo, uh, I ended up getting a job in a solutions-focused journalism organization. And I just fell in love with it. Um, so for people who don't know, uh, solutions focused journalism is um, an approach to reporting that uh, focuses on uh, responses to social issues as well as the problems themselves. So what you're really doing is you, um, you are using, you know, uh, credible evidence and explaining the ways in which um, it, yeah, how and why responses are working or not working. So it's really uh, a way to help drive um, more effective citizenship. And I felt very motivated to work in a space or to be writing in a way that it could uh, help people understand an issue or challenge the way that they're thinking about a particular issue to really think critically about um, some global and local problems. So what type of, like how many types of different journalisms like are there? Like, is there like a traditional school versus this newer one you're speaking of? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, I'm not exactly sure um, that like the lines are so um, clear cut like that. I think more and more people are moving towards the structure. Uh, where you know um, you're, you're trying to think of journalism as a way not only to inform but to uh, give uh, the readers the tools to sort of think for themselves and um, challenge maybe their own conceptions about a particular issue. Um, I think when I think of more traditional you know journalism and more traditional media I'm thinking about uh, like daily news so things happen and you just need to report exactly what happened and because of you know uh, because it's so time sensitive you don't necessarily have the time to really dig in and do the research and uh, reflect on some of the issues or just reporting as things happen and then there's a slow journalism movement where you, instead of uh, you know, reacting to what's happening as it's happening, you're really taking a step back and thinking through some of the larger issues. Of course, both lend themselves to different situations, right? So, you know, there's certain times that we want to know what's happening as it's happening and certain and for certain issues are really um, there's a benefit in like stopping and thinking through um, what the problem is, what are the possible solutions, are they effective, are they not effective. So um, I tend to gravitate towards uh, the, set, the, the latter. Uh, so thinking, like really stopping and thinking and spending some time reflecting on uh, some of the larger issues. Yeah, and so I, I worked in Brazil for two years. Um, and then after a couple of years, I realized that I would really benefit from a more, struct from more structured training. So that's why I moved to Canada to pursue a master's of journalism. Um, you know, I, a lot of the um, writing that I'd done up until moving here, it, it was just what I knew for myself and what felt good. And um, I had some help from my editors, of course, but uh, I didn't have any formal training. And I just thought I would really benefit from sort of learning some of um, the theory and the thinking behind uh, the way that we tell stories. Yeah. So as a journalist, like when you were working in the field, like how do you know something makes a good story like that you would you know take the time to do the research and write about 
Yeah, so like I said, I'm interested mostly like investigative or feature writing. So um, I'm talking about um, stories that are longer in length and also stories that take a longer time to research and write. Mm -hmm. So usually what I'm thinking through um, when I am, when I'm first interested in a story is, does it speak to a larger issue? Um, is there a way that I can make people think and perhaps reevaluate existing beliefs? Um, I'm often drawn to stories that disrupt uh, systems of power or hold spaces, uh, hold space for other voices. So um, is there a way for me to incorporate voices from um, equity seeking marginalized communities? So like I said, I gravitate to writing about uh, social justice issues uh, like access to health, housing, food. And I think in journalism, what usually happens is um, you kind of become specialized in a certain area and you sort of build your knowledge around that area. So if you're interested in issues around housing, you tend to follow what's happening in housing where you're living, um, same with health. So um, yeah, you, you kind of know what, uh, what's happening and you have a pretty good sense of uh, whether this could be a story that has resonance um, across your readership. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, that's usually kind of how I go about thinking through whether a topic uh, would make a good story. Is journalism a competitive industry to find a job in? Like, would it be hard to, for like new grads to work in the industry? <laughs> Yeah, um, in some ways I feel like I'm probably not the best person to ask this because I don't work in that industry full time. But what I can say is, you know, my experience in Vancouver has been that the industry is in some ways very insular and small. Um, there's definitely limited resources and a lot of media organizations are facing dwindling budgets. So um, when you're thinking about people that are working in journalism, there's people that are working for media organizations. And this could be like larger, more traditional media organizations like CBC, The Globe and Mail, Vancouver Sun, or they could be working for web-based younger media organizations like uh, Van City Bus, Vancouver Observer, and even the TAI. Um, then you have people that are working for production companies. So these are people that, um, uh, you know, a media organization will outsource their work to a production company and the individuals working that production company will sort of provide the, the manpower to, uh, to go through and research and produce that story. And then you also have freelancers or contractors. Um, right now, there's a lot of freelance and contract work. Um, it's one of the reasons why I decided to go into communications um, because the uh, pay and the amount of work just wasn't um, constant and in order to live in a city as expensive as Vancouver I just needed some sort of financial stability so I think yeah it could be really competitive it could be really challenging to get in um, in, if you're willing to sort of sacrifice some of the comforts and you know then, then maybe you can make it work um i see a lot of my friends who graduated with me in 2015 and some of them are just now getting you know um full-time jobs um so it it's definitely something i think that on an individual basis you have to see whether it kind of works with what you're looking for um and where you want to go yeah, because yeah, I think journalism, like similar to writing, like the barrier is there, but at the same time, you have all these people that are doing it themselves, right? All the, I'm just thinking about conspiracy reporting and whatnot, you know, and then when people look at something, sometimes it's hard to tell, is it legit or not? Because it looks like the site looks legit, right? And you're like, maybe they are legit, or maybe they're not, right? So I think sometimes people need to think about what they're reading and, uh, and the sources, right? And you know, sure. I know journalists do some research, but then the other guy could say they did some research too, right? So it's, you know, it depends on the person, I guess, on the audience. Now, you're also writing, you're also doing creative writing. So why, uh, why, so I guess at one point, well, you were always doing creative writing. Like when you were a kid, you were doing film, and then now you were doing journalism, and, and now you're doing, I guess, more creative writing, like when you have time, I guess? Yeah, so... Um... 
you know, I did a lot of creative writing as a kid. And then I think I didn't do much at all as, you know, while I was in um, my undergrad or when I worked as a journalist or even through grad school. Really, you know, I, after grad school, I applied to a few jobs in journalism and the pay was just not enough to allow me to live in Vancouver. I basically blown through all of my savings to come to Canada and uh, do this master of journalism course uh, program at UBC. And I didn't have any more savings to sort of, you know, keep me going uh, beyond that point. So I, find, I needed to find a job that allowed me to stay here. And so I ended up getting a job in communications. Um, and a lot of the work that I did as part of the communications was not the writing that really like made me feel very um, inspired and invested. So um, I really try, I try to do some short-term investigative, investigative journalism projects. And, um, but I was really struggling to find like the time to research and the time to pitch and um, balancing that with like a full-time job. Um, at the same time, there was a lot that was happening in my personal life. So I'd lost uh, two grandparents about a year apart and my parents had moved back to Japan for work. So um, I was really trying to make sense of my Japanese heritage. Like the, my grandparents were people that I knew but not, didn't know very well because of the language barrier, because of the culture barrier and the distance. Um, so these are all things that were sort of on my mind. And then kind of by chance, I came across the writer's studio at SFU. I had a few friends who had done it and said some amazing things about it. Um, and I thought, why not? like I have absolutely nothing to lose I can apply for it and then we can see you know if I get it I can make a decision then if I um, go through it or not um, and I did I ended up uh, getting into the SFU uh, writer studio and uh, ended up working with an amazing mentor JJ Lee um, and um, you know try to basically find ways to sort of leverage my personal experience and find um, ways that it can resonate with people so kind of taking a similar approach to the way that I do journalism finding like an issue in my life and thinking through like are there other people that are going through this how can I write it in a way that you know can get people to think about what's going with that going on with them yeah okay do you have any advice for people that um want to start writing but they don't know how to focus or start a piece like, you know, there are so many people, what's the stat, what, 90% of people want to write a book, but not many of them uh, actually go through with it, right? So. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, I would say, first, one of the most important things is to focus on what keeps you writing. So it's so easy to get discouraged, especially at the beginning. So, you know, if prompts work for, work for you, do that. If a daily time commitment is like works for you, do that. So really trying to find what keeps you uh, excited about what you're working on is really important. Um, second, I would say, you know, setting a goal. So again, a goal that works for you, not a goal that somebody else is imposing on you. So, you know, for some people having a deadline for a contest is a way to keep them motivated and work towards something. For other people, it's about, you know, the number of pages that they're working on. So if you hit, you know, 20 pages, then you feel like you've accomplished something. Uh, or it might be, you know, different versions of the draft. Like by the time you get to version five, you feel like you, you have like a more polished piece. So I think it really depends on who you are. Um, and finally, I think third uh, is finding a community of writers that can help you. Uh, keep motivated. So I have some writing friends that I met through the SFU program and some others who I've met through the MFA at UBC. And it, I think it's just really important to have people that, that continue to be in that space um, and, you know, have low moments and high moments so, so that you can also see that sometimes you're going to have writer's block and sometimes whatever you thought was going to pan out is not going to pan out. Uh, but sometimes you will. So I think it, it's kind of like a roller coaster. And as, as long as you keep yourself interested in moving forward, uh, you'll get there eventually. Cool. So what is the latest project you're working on right now? Uh, yeah, so I've been working on a uh, fiction manuscript about uh, a 19-year-old half-Asian teen 
uh, who begins to pick fights on the streets of London after um, a bad coming out experience with her very traditional and very religious family. Um, this work uh, kind of draws on some aspects of my college experience and my relationship with my parents in particular. Um, you know, for me, when I think back to being 19, it was such a tender age. It was the first time that I was away from my family and um, it really gave me this opportunity to explore who I was. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that created uh, some tension and conflicts with the people um, that were closest to me. But in some ways, I guess that makes for a good story, so. Well, cool. So uh, you're going to do a reading for us. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're reading and then you can start reading? Yeah, for sure. So um, I was inspired to uh, write this story by the idea that silence can be a language. So growing up, I uh, struggled with reconciling my father's traditions with my own way of saying goodbye. And when I was about eight years old, uh, I learned from my great grandmother that she uh, means both for and death in Japanese. So um, the way that I've structured this piece is that through four experiences with death, I explore what it means to mourn in a culture and language you have limited knowledge of. And I'll be reading two sections of the story, uh, the beginning and the end of it. Each, it's 6.30 a.m., the whole family is sitting around the dining table for breakfast. Gohan, tamagoyaki, tofu, sake, miso shiru. My sister and I eat one, two, three bowls of rice, each time with a different topping. Nori, furikake, shirasu. Between mouthfuls, I show Hiyobachan, my great-grandmother, that I can count in Japanese. Ich, she follows along. Ni, my sister joins in. Son, my dad smiles approvingly. She, Hiyobachan's eyes widen. She shakes her head. Yong, she says. I shake my head back. Ich, ni, son, she, go. Chiyo, you are naide. I look back at my dad, my eyes pleading for help. She and Yom both mean four, he explains. She also means death. Hiobachan is superstitious. It's bad luck. I try it again. Ich, ni, son, Yom, go, rok, shich, hach, kyu, ju. Hiobachan claps in approval. I smile awkwardly. This is about the extent of my vocabulary. The last time we visited, I could speak fluent Japanese, but now that I'm eight, I go to a Portuguese speaking school in Sao Paulo and I've forgotten most of the language. Smiling and nodding works for most occasions. When that fails, I call out to my dad. Kyo Bachan's 91, but she doesn't look it. She has a handful of white hairs, which she ties in a perfectly round bun. Apart from her hands painted with sunspots, she's almost wrinkle free. Only her posture gives away her age. Hiobachan walks at a 135 degree angle as a result of carrying children on her back while she worked the rice fields. After breakfast, she gestures for me to follow her to the bedroom. I drag my feet to imitate her walk. She slides the shoji room divider open and we take off our slippers and sit around the warm kotatsu table. It's January, the house is cold. Our feet meet in the middle and she laughs. She turns on the TV and hands me a bowl full of oranges. We sit in silence. At 10 a.m., she looks at me, presses her, hand on presses her hands on the table and sweeps her legs under her knees. She pushes the kotatsu away and digs her feet into the ground. This is the fastest I've seen her move. Hiobachan puts on a light blue quilted coat, opens the door to her room and points back to the main house. I don't get it. She gives her holds two tugs and points again. I run as fast as I can. I grab my coat, gloves, and scarf. Before we walk out, she picks up a couple of oranges and puts them in her pocket. We walk in the opposite direction to the main house. My mom told me it was once a minka, but now it's just a refurbished two-story building that isn't even as old as me. We make our way down a poorly lit corridor with piles of old TV catalogs stacked up to the ceiling, then down a set of stairs into the outdoors. She takes off her slippers and slides her feet into pink rubber shoes for gardening. There's an, there's an identical pair for me. We follow the fence that separates my grandparents' house from their neighbors. 
The path is narrow. We're squeezed between a concrete fence and the side of my family's tatami mat factory. I can hardly fit. Then we finally come out to the back of the house where the workers' entrance to the business is located. We wave to my grandfather and uncle in their blue coveralls. They nod in return. They're carrying three stacked tatami mats, holding an end each. I have no idea where we're going. We walk along the street that leads to the department store where I bought my origami paper. We turn left at a small stream where just yesterday my dad showed me how to catch frogs. We follow the main road, then veer to the left until we reach an open space with rows of perfectly stacked box-shaped stones, gravestones with characters I cannot read. She walks up a small set of steps and stops by one of the stacks. It's a tight space, but I follow right behind her. In front of us is a large stone with our family name carved in it. We are at a cemetery. Hiobachan removes a wooden dipper from her coat. She scoops up water from a nearby, bu nearby bucket and pours it over the gravestone. From her other pocket, she takes out a spade and a small rake. She tends to the weeds around the grave with surgical precision. Then she takes out an incense stick and two oranges, handing one over to me. She lights the incense and props the stick up. She places her orange on the grave. I put mine next to her. She joins her hands, staring ahead. One, two, three, four. I count how long she stays frozen. Eyes closed, she takes a small bow. She looks at me and smiles. Then she picks up her tools and we walk down the, the stone steps, out on the street, back to the house. Over the next three weeks, I spend every morning with Hiobachan. We watch TV and sit by the kotatsu. At 10 a.m., we get up and walk over to the cemetery. I become familiar with the routine after a few days. I watch the gravestone, I pick up the weeds. She never asks for help and I never offer. I just do. Sometimes it's easier to hear when you're both silent. She. I wake up at 3.23 a.m. to my mom's call. Fujichan is no longer. Last year, my parents finally moved to Japan to be closer to my grandfather, but my dad's new position kept him from visiting more often. A month ago, Fujichan went into the hospital for routine exams. It started with a cold, then a lung infection. His organs started to fail a few days later. Your dad's not doing well, Emmy. Be gentle. My dad calls five minutes later. Nakunata, it means gone or lost. I ask him if I should go to the funeral. He says he's going to take the rest of the day off and go home. I remind him I need to get a ticket soon. He hands up the phone. I pace back and forth in my Vancouver apartment, then walk to the bathroom and turn on the tap. Sitting fully clothed in an empty bathtub, I watch the water rise. I submerge my body and let out a scream. The sound muffled, the chaos contained. One, two, three, four. I come up for air, tears trickling down my face. The world is just as I left it, dark and silent. I walk over to the computer and buy the first ticket I can find. My parents don't pick me up at the airport. They're ready on their way to the funeral. By now, the commute to Tokyo station is familiar to me. I run to catch the Nozomi to Shinya Maguchi. At the platform, no one's waiting for me. I try to brush off my frustration. I pick up my phone, turn on roaming and begin to Google death in Japan, Japanese funeral, and funeral traditions in Japan. I'm acutely aware of my ignorance. No one has told me what to expect. As always, I'm underprepared to be here. My dad meets me at the funeral home. I try to feign calmness. I've never seen a corpse before. I walk behind him, hoping he'll shield me from the shock. He slices the shoji open. I brace myself. The smell of incense is overwhelming. Lying on the tatami, Ojichan. If it weren't for his perfectly aligned body, I would have thought he was asleep. My mom is kneeling next to him. She gestures for me to take a seat. We pass around a small bowl with water and a damp cloth and take turns cleaning his body. Ojichan is covered with a thin white sheet. Underneath it, his skin is bare. I gently lift his leg. It's heavy and stiff. I wash his left foot, then his right. I start with a big toe down to his ankle. His skin calloused and tough, his heel cracked. 
Two men from the funeral home dress him in a blue silk kimono with a white diamond shaped pattern. One man puts both arms through the robe, stretching the left and right sleeves, carefully puts Oji Chan's left arm through and straightens out the kimono underneath him. With the help of his partner, he rolls my grandfather on his side, passing the remainder of the robe to his right side. They lay his body down and pass the right arm through the other sleeve. They wrap the left side of the kimono over the right and tug at the white sheet covering my grandfather, removing it from under the robe. They're careful not to reveal bits of skin in the process. Then one of them wraps prayer beads around Oji Chen's hands and places them over his chest in praying position. Across the room, a selection of awkward smiles. My mom taps me on the shoulder. Tonight, you sleep with your grandfather. I let this sink in. I feel the shock, but I don't react. I'm numb. I look at my dad a few feet away. He stares at her Ji Chan, then out the window. One of the last times I saw my grandfather, he asked if he could show me something. With a lot of gesturing and some broken Japanese, I said yes. He picked up a large box from under his desk and took out a magazine. He opened it to a bookmark page and held a magnifying glass to a photo of almost a hundred businessmen. Right where his index finger rested was my father. Inside the box, a collection of all of my dad's achievements since he was 15. A few months later, I asked my dad about the box. He never seen it. We arrange our futons in a row. My uncle and cousin at one end, my sister and I at the other, with my parents sandwiched in the middle. My grandfather lies at our heads. Lights are off. Out on the corridor, old floorboards creak. I hold my breath, bracing myself for an unexpected movement or sound. I watch my dad's chest rise and fall. His breathing is heavy but controlled. My lips part, but nothing comes out. A tear falls, wetting the pillowcase underneath his head. I look at the silhouette of my grandfather's stiffened body just a few feet away. Between word and mouth exists a silence that doesn't need translation. Each, a silence of understanding. Ni, a silence of pain. Son, a silence of guilt. She, a silence of loss. Well, thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, your story with us. Have you been back to Japan since the funeral? Yes, I have. Um, my parents now live in Tokyo and I've been visiting Japan on average about twice a year. Um, obviously not during the pandemic, but before <laughs> yeah. then, about twice a year, yeah. We don't always go to Yamaguchi, but yeah, I've been to Japan plenty of times since then. Awesome. So thank you very much uh, for being on the RC Raven with us. And uh, the story between word and mouth will be in the Belief Anthology. And you have a website where people can find you at, right? The emisasagawa.com? Yeah. So we'll post the link in the description of the podcast so uh, people can look up more of your wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. For more upcoming episodes of the Artsy Raven about writing and publishing, visit us at jfgarar.com slash podcast. A reminder to Patreon subscribers that there is bonus content available for every episode on the Patreon website. If you enjoyed the show, you can show your appreciation by buying us some digital coffee. The Artsy Raven is produced by J.F. Garrard. The voice in the show's introduction is Chris Gorman, and music is by Tim Moore. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time, stay safe. Mm -hmm.